Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much uh, for attending this talk and for coming to Dev Day. Uh, I'm actually very excited to be here. I'm from Canada, as you may be able to tell. Uh, we have a very large uh, Polish um, community in Toronto, where I'm from, that has been there, been with us for a very long time, and they've made a lot of tremendous contributions to our culture. And it's really a privilege for me to be able to come here to your home and share a little bit about your culture, uh, while also immersing myself in the culture we share of development. Um, I want to talk about optimism, and um, I don't mean that in the commonplace sense of the word. When people have a particular profession, like engineering or computer science or medicine or psychology, they often take an ordinary word, but they use it in a very special technical way. We programmers do this all the time, and so do psychologists. And what I'm going to share with you is a work of a uh, psychologist by the, by the name of uh, Dr. Seligman, uh, who uses optimism in a very specific way. And I'm going to share that with you, as well as share with you a little bit about my experience with uh, this person's models and teaching and how it affected my life. Um, like the speaker before me in this room, I am not a psychologist, I am not an expert. I will try to be clear about which things I am repeating this person's actual research, done in a very professional manner, which things are my own experiences, which is just anecdotal evidence, and which things are just my conjectures or my opinions, which I share with you for what they are worth, but they are not the same as uh, research or uh, as experience. Now, um, this Dr. Seligman came up with a particular framework for understanding why people are motivated, why people are productive in what they do, why people are happy in what they do. Um, and he called it learned optimism, and there's a book, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. I'm also going to be adding some additional material since the last time I gave this talk, talking about another book which has a related subject, which we'll get to. Um, and I'll talk about my conjectures for how the, the two frameworks fit together. So uh, here we go. A number of years ago, I was at a low point in my life. I don't know if anybody else here has had low points. I suspect the answer is yes. Sometimes they can be very difficult uh, to get out of, in part because if you feel depressed or sad, it's almost like an autoimmune system of the motivational uh, part of your personality. It makes you less motivated to fix whatever is making you sad. Um, so it can be tough to get out of. I don't know if other people uh, empathize with that, but that's where I was. And as it happened, I came across this book, and sometimes you're really depressed and you, you find somebody gives you some advice, try this, do this, and you're saying, oh, forget it. But if it, they, if it just happens to be at the exact right time when you've got enough energy to try it, and your mind is really open to making a change in your life, Sometimes it, you really get some great results out of it. And that doesn't mean that it's better than anything else I've ever tried or read or thought about, but it does mean that I had some experience and it worked for me and I want to share that with you. The book is Learned Optimism. And uh, the two words are very important because as I'm about to describe to you, I'm going to talk about what Dr. Martin Seligman means when he says optimism. And I'm also going to talk about the learned aspect of it, which is about how we can change um, our own particular attitudes and the way we um, motivate ourselves and the way we describe the universe to ourselves. Now, this sounds all very big and describe the universe and motivational and so on. And I know sometimes people come up and talk about creativity or empowering yourself and so on. And I'm always a little, that's very nice uh, about it. However, the fact of the matter is we program computers and we do that with our minds and we do that in teams with other people. And if you only ever think about the programming and never think about yourself, about your sleep patterns or your moods, or about the way you communicate with other people or give feedback to other people or get feedback from other people, or the way your organization is, is organized or about things like firing people, it's kind of like the um, car person who loves to drive but never wants to take the car into the shop to be maintained. You simply cannot keep upping your productivity by learning new technical tools. You have to have a balanced approach to your career on the, on, as an arc over, over your entire life. And so I do feel that this is a very appropriate thing to do and to think about in moderation, in the right amount. So, um, now this book is written by someone who has an actual degree and did actual research and is actually very well known. So what I will say to you is, if you like what you hear, please go out and read the book and learn about it for yourself. If you don't like what I hear, assume that the problem is I can't describe it to you and go read the book anyway and find out what I didn't get right. 
So what he did was he went out to research why some people in sales and some other occupations were better than others. And there's some obvious things that have to do with actually learning sales techniques and so on. And there are other things that have to do with motivation, and he was very interested in this. He's also the person, if you've ever heard about learned helplessness, I won't be discussing that with you, but he also did research into that. So the idea of motivation was very big to him. And when I say he did research, he actually sat down, he worked out various ways to ask people questions and then to measure their productivity and, and so on, and to measure their happiness. And he came up with a theory that would allow him to predict which people would be succe more successful than others and to predict which people would be happier than others. And his theory is based on something called explanatory theory, which is, it's all based on when things happen to, our, to us in our life, we make up a little story about what caused them. I mean, we do this all the time. I mean, mankind has wondered, what is it that makes this? That's very interesting. Speaking of explanations, I do not have one for that. Um, let's try the obvious things that don't involve kicking the computer. <laughs> Any suggestions? Okay. <laughs> well, we will get, have a chance to observe my optimism in practice. So his, um, his, his uh, theory is, based, is part of a larger work called explanatory theory, which is the way we explain things to ourselves that happen in our life. And this explanatory theory is extremely important. Um, because, for example, if you explain that everything bad in your life is because of your own mistakes, you're going to be a lot more depressed than someone who walks around and says, well, some of them I can, are my mistakes and I can fix, and some of them are things that are involved, and I can't fix those, and I will work on which things I can fix, and then I will shrug my shoulders and just try to work around the things I can't fix, and on I go. It seems very obvious. And he made a, not an entire life's work, but a great deal of work out of digging into that exact idea. Now, he made two particular claims after he'd done his research. The first of those claims is that he can predict how, pr how productive someone's going to be and how successful they are by testing certain things about the way they explain life events to themselves. Now, this is very important because in science, and psychology is a science even though Hacker News doesn't appear to think so, if you can make a falsifiable prediction, you are doing science. So if he says, I can predict this, and then you test it, and then someone, then you know, a large number of people don't conform to his test, then you say, ah, I've, we've falsified your theory, Dr. Seligman. It's very important to begin with this, the ability to, to predict. And his test basically comes out with, it's more complicated than this, but we can simplify it and say it comes out with a number. And if the number is, is positive, you are optimistic. And if the number is negative, you can guess what word goes with that, pessimistic. And he, the big thing about him was that the number, as the more optimistic it is, the more he could predict happiness and productive. And the more negative it was, the more he could predict unhappiness and unproductive. And he did research, which he says proves it. His second of two claims is also very interesting. And that was that you can teach yourself to get a higher score on the test. And that's not completely amazing, because humans are actually pretty good at cheating on tests. And if you study how um, interviewing for programming job works, you realize that it's all about cheating on tests. But what makes this very interesting is this. When people teach themselves to do better on the test, they wind up being happier and more productive. That is a very interesting claim. Because if you just have the ability to predict things, but you can't actually do anything about them, this is like somebody, the doctor telling me, you have terminal cancer. All right, party, and then it's over. Whereas if the doctor says, it's looking pretty bad, but we can do something with your diet, and we can do something with these drugs, and we can do this, and we can do that, and I can make the difference between you're having 10 more years and you're having 25 or more, more, more years, whoa ho, tell me all about it. We can do something about it. So this second claim is very, very, very exciting. Now, The other thing about it that's very, very important is that 
it's not just almost anything you can sort of fudge for a month or two. You know, it's like you want to have, be on a better diet. And you can do almost anything for four weeks. But can you change your life for a long period of time? And his research also shows this is the case, that people who make these changes make long-term changes. So reading this, I was very, very motivated to try his, his, uh, his particular prescriptions for making my life better because I saw some hope for getting out of the low point in my life. And much of what motivates us to write software, to be in this industry, is an opportunity to make changes for the better, whether it is in a particular industry or in our personal lives or on teams. We also owe that to ourselves. And that's part of why I'm sharing this with you, in the hope that there may be one or two or three people for whom this can really benefit, and there may be a lot more for whom this can benefit a little bit, or you know somebody. So, I explained the whole explanatory theory to you. It's all about explaining life's events to yourselves, to ourselves. And I'll go into a little bit more detail. Here's an example. There's actually some code in this talk. How about that? I'm sorry it's Ruby and not .NET. I understand it. But you all get the general idea. Software comes from code. Now, back in 2009, I was registering for a conference. Uh, it was called Ruby Fringe in Toronto. Uh, interesting. And um, a person who I had a lot of respect for walked up to me and said, hey, you're Reg Braithwaite. And being the modest, shy, and retiring person that I am, I said, why, yes. Yes, I am. Now, you all know that that never ends well, right? Sure enough, he said, you wrote that and Dan, Gem, and Ruby. And ignoring the fact that I already had one foot over the yawning chasm with the spikes at the bottom, I proceeded to step into the void. Why, yes. Yes, I did. And he said to me, I don't like it. <laughs> True story. You can't make this stuff up. He was what you'd call an opinionated software developer, which is a very rare breed, as you know. Yeah. Now, what matters here really is not his opinion of my work. Just like my opinion of your work or of Brian's talk, that's not as really that important. What's really important is our opinion of what just happened to us. What really counts here is, how did I explain to myself what happened when somebody walked up and told me, I don't like it? Now, Dr. Seligman came up with three different things you could sort of analyze or test about an explanation. The first of those three things, these three orthogonal axes, is whether the thing that just happened is personal or impersonal. So, if I thought that um, this thing was really personal, this bit of, shall we call it, constructive feedback, I might say this. Some people like and and because I something something, or in his case, some people dislike and and because I something something. Whereas the reverse of that, if I take feedback in an impersonal way, it might be, some people dislike and and because they something something. Not me. That's his, his fetish or hang up about opening core classes or um, law of Demeter being violated by adding an extra dot and and in there or whatever it is. He doesn't like creating proxy objects that forward methods using method missing. Whatever it is that he doesn't like, he doesn't like. It's his bag and I don't need to carry it. And this personal versus impersonal is one of the three big sort of axes of explanations. And I'm sure most people realize, as I say this, I hope you're nodding either physically or inside your head, because this is a big part, as you know, with people who are not feeling well or feeling very well, good feedback, bad feedback, it often centers around taking things personally 
Or, in a more positive way, I could phrase the same thing, taking personal responsibility for things. Which things we take personally and which things we don't take personally are very important. However, there's a little bit more to uh, Dr. Seligman's research in this area, but the key thing is that he found a way to objectively measure this. He'd asked people about events and so on, and he came up with a way to measure it, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what he did with that. Now, we had another axis, and that was specific and general. Now, in the case of and and, somebody might come to me, like he did, and say, I don't like and and, and I might say, oh, he didn't like it. If I wrote a blog post, I might say, oh, Hacker News didn't like this blog post. Didn't make the front page. One point, downvoted. However, the flip side of that is I might take a much broader sort of perspective on it. Here's one. My blog post is on the front page. Hacker News validated my experience as a programmer. That's a lot bigger and more general. It's something, an explanation that touches more things. This particular blog post being on the front page is just an example of a much bigger thing. So Seligman's second axis was whether things are specific or general, whether it's just this one narrow thing or whether it's this one thing is an example of a bigger sort of phenomena. And he had a third axis. And that third axis is temporal. Is this particular thing just right now, or is it part of a longer trend, a bigger arc? For example, here's a team. Our work made this project a success, just this one time. The project might be broad or it might be narrow, but when you say this project, you just mean right now, there's some success, which is great. However, you might say something like, this was one highlight in my and PagerDuty's ongoing growth. How about that? That just talks about it started some time ago, and it sounds like it's going to keep going for a long time. So some explanations refer to just the here and now. They refer to a temporary phenomena. And some explanations refer to an ongoing thing, a permanent phenomena. And temporary versus permanent makes up the third of the three axes. Naturally, I'll recap. The first of those three was personal versus impersonal. The second of those three was specific versus general. And the third was whether something we explained something in a temporary way or whether we explained it in terms of an ongoing permanent phenomenon. And Dr. Seligman did a bunch of research and figured out that by measuring how much people's explanations were personal, specific, um, or temporary, or the opposites, impersonal, general, or permanent, that he could determine their optimism. And from that, he could predict their happiness and their productivity. Now, one of the things when I was reading this that kind of troubled me was it wasn't obvious to me how this would work. For example, I know many people, I see one in the mirror almost every day, who when something bad is happening to the, them, they, they take it personally. I also know many successful people who take credit for their, for their accomplishments and sometimes for the accomplishments of people around them. So taking things personally or attributing things to, to, to you doesn't seem like you could predict success or happiness from it. Likewise with specific in general. Sometimes somebody goes on a date and you say, how'd it go? And they say, ah, this person's not for me. Other times, they're just weeping. I can't meet anyone. It's, you know, this is very general. And the same thing, as you, as you can probably gather, I'm going to say about temporary and personal. You'll know people who say, say, oh, great deal with the something something sale. And the salesperson's there like, yeah, I got lucky. Like, it's just this temporary one-time thing. And other times, it's like, I'm a great salesperson. Been great forever. Will be great forever. It's really, I, I couldn't see the connection, how you could predict people's happiness and success from these three things. Maybe the problem was the way Seligman laid them out. But the way Seligman laid them out in the book is not related to the truth that's behind it. So I kept reading. Now, he put together a little test. And he introduced one more factor, which explained the whole thing to me. And that was, 
If you just measured my person, my, how, how personally I took things, or how specific, or how general, the data was all over the place. But if you divided the data into two sets, as you've probably heard about in other talks today, there was a pattern. And it was divided based on whether I was explaining something that happened that was good for me, or something that happened bad. As it turns out, when bad things happened, I took it personally, I said, this is a general thing, and I said, it's permanent. So when I was in that low point, if someone walked up and said they don't like and and, I would have said, yeah, people don't really like my approach to programming. It's like, what the hell? This, is, this, this one person has one opinion, and I've stretched it out into all people, my approach to programming, this big thing, that goes on forever. But when good things happen, somebody said, nice blog post. And they're, and they're like, yeah, yeah, Hacker News is really, you know, kind of up on functional programming in JavaScript right now. It's impersonal, it's not me. It's just this one moment, and it's just this one blog post or this one little thing. I was very inconsistent. And as I explain this to you, I'm sure you can see that this is a very bad kind of inconsistency. Because whenever something is bad, you like wrap it around yourself and carry it with you forever. And whenever something is good, you just kind of look at it and throw it away. You don't associate it with yourself. So you just end up with all this bad baggage carrying around. Now, I said before that you know, he talks about optimism. And the opposite of that is pessimism. And I hope you will not be surprised that in his book, I was described as a pessimist. What is the opposite? The opposite is also someone who has this asymmetry. The good things in their life, the good events that happen, they explain as being about them. They explain in general terms, and they explain in permanent terms. So when an optimist has a blog post, number one at Hacker News, or something like that, they say, yeah, yeah, I get that a lot, and it makes sense because I have a pretty good approach to programming and people appreciate that, or whatever it is they say. When something bad happens, well, and, and I don't like it, they say, well, he didn't like that one piece of code. But the rest of the conference was great. The bad things in their life, it's not that they ignore them and throw them away. I mean, they take feedback, they, they incorporate it, but they don't carry it around with them forever. They don't cloak themselves in it. And as a result, this asymmetry leads to them being happier and more productive. Now, this irrationality, in a negative sense, is what drives people to become pessimists and to become morose and to become depressed. Now, I'm casting these big terms. Most people are not this extreme. If you were, you'd be in therapy, not sitting here. As a matter of fact, the fact that you're here is a kind of positive optimism. But likewise, most people are not extreme megalomaniac optimists. They're just a little bit. But we also, human beings, drift between the two back and forth. And if you had no idea about a framework or understanding it, you might just drift back and forth and have no sort of introspection as to why this might happen. So having a framework for thinking about it is very valuable. However, there was something else that I talked about earlier. I said he made two claims. I've explained his first claim and how he comes about it, this asymmetry in the way you explain these three things to yourself. And there's also his second claim, which is that you can teach yourself. And the way he, d he does that is through cognitive behavioral therapy, repetition, over and over and over again. You take notes about things that happen to yourself every day, you write them down the way you interpret them, and then you take a critical look at, at it, and then you rewrite them in a more optimistic way. You take the negative things and you rewrite them so that they're impersonal, so that they're specific and they're temporary. And you take the positive things and you rewrite your initial explanation, and you rewrite it in such a way that it is, it is, the positive things are personal, uh, general, and permanent. And you, you first you write down your gut reaction. You don't lie to yourself about the way you're thinking. You write it down the way you first think about it, and then you force yourself to write it the other way, and you do this over and over again. And uh, as I've joked in the past, you don't skip leg day, and you don't skip cognitive behavioral therapy. You can't do twice as much two days from now and skip tomorrow. You have to do the work. However, when humans do this work, they get better. And that's really interesting. And if you feel like walking out now and going and buying the book, please do. It may change your life. However, there's a bit more. And the bit more is 
that when you have a framework for this, it's like knowing about refactoring. Instead of being really, really scared to submit a pull request because the code not, might not be good, if you know how to make code better, you can submit a pull request earlier and get feedback earlier and then refactor later, right? The same is true with our own personal moods and so on. If you feel confident that you have a tool that can help yourself, you can afford to be a bit more confident in life because you know how to fix things when things go a little bit south. You know that if you get depressed or morose, you can come back from there, which allows you to take more chances. And I don't know if that's the direct cause of it, but once I had this tool in my hand, I felt a lot better about myself because I realized that even when things went bad, I could fix them, which is already, as you can probably tell, turning my own depression into a temporary thing. The fact that I had this tool meant that all of my moods were really temporary. I just had to fix them. And the conclusion after reading this and going through the exercises and going through this experience myself, which is my anecdotal, you know, N equals one experience, you see right here, there is a way to look at your, the way you explain things to yourself and determine whether or not they are interfering with your happiness and your productivity. And if they are, there is something you can do about it. You can become happier and more productive. And again, you don't have to sit here and say, well, I'm a depressed person. It could just be a, a moment in your life that could be shorter with this technology. Now, there's another thing. This thing rung true with me, or rang true with me, I should say in English, and it really helped me. But I knew a bunch of people who kind of had a different outlook on life. Many people that I know who are successful will tell me that everyone they know, they're in triathlons that they compete against, are naturally athletic. Everyone else on their team is smart, but not them. They're not naturally athletic, and they're not smart. But they will tell you that they work harder than those other people. They will tell you that they study harder than those other people. They will tell you that they discipline themselves to just keep going, and that's how they keep up or even beat those other people. They don't take a permanent, general kind of approach to the way they think about their own success. Um, at first glance, it seems like they are a counterexample to Seligman's theories about optimism. Now, mind you, he never said all successful people fit this optimism thing, so. But after I gave a version of this talk earlier this year, I had a number of people come up and tell me this, and I wrote a blog post about this um, a number of years ago, and they said similar things. Uh, people said similar things, a few. And so I decided to dive into it. Now, A number of people quoted me a book by Dr. Carol Dweck um, about mindsets. And Dr. Dweck has a completely different theory. And I said, you know what? I'm going to be talking about optimism at uh, Dev Day. I'm going to talk about, about mindsets there too. And I'm going to integrate the two together as best I understand it. Now, Dr. Dweck also did research. Dr. Dweck also came up with a framework for explaining people's success and failure. Dr. Dweck also associates this with explanatory theory, the way we explain success and failure. All of that is in common. It's just her particular model is different. She also says that you can change the way you explain success and failure and be more successful. Her theory is based on the fixed and growth mindsets. Has anyone here heard of this? I see hands. Excellent. Now, like Dr. Seligman, she worked out a way you can ask some people a bunch of tests and so on. And I don't have time to give everybody here a, uh, one of her tests. And they're probably copyrighted or something anyway. But her thing was you can divide people into those who have a fixed or a growth mindset. The fixed mindset is a belief that people have talents and they're mostly predetermined and they mostly don't change. And activities we do, like study or attending these, uh, these conferences and so on, merely serve to sort of, I don't know, cut the loose edges off and reveal your inner talent. They don't increase. Some people are smart, some aren't. 
Some are naturally athletic, some aren't. Some people get along well with other people, some don't. Some people are handsome, Zach Holman, some aren't. That's the fixed mindset. I don't know about the opposite, but the other one that she describes is the growth mindset, which is the belief that, well, obviously human potential is capped in some way. You know, we haven't got under nine seconds in the 100 meters in the Olympics, despite all the best advances in chemistry. But the growth mindset is that we don't reveal our inner potential when we do things like train or study or attend conferences, learn. What we do is we develop it. We actually build it. That we are constantly growing in various axes. And um, there are some people who kind of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But some people are very much of the fixed mindset. And you hear it when they talk about things like um, being uh, naturally athletic. And some people are very much of the growth mindset when they say things like, well, I train harder, so it's no surprise that I win. Her most celebrated anecdote concerns children. When children get something like an A in preschool or whenever it is that, that you test them, some parents tell them, you're a smart kid, you deserve that A. Other parents tell their children, you studied and paid attention in school, that's why you got an A. And according to Dr. Dweck's research, the children who are told that they studied and paid attention in school wind up doing better, not just immediately, but she tracked people for decades versus the people who were told they were smart. And that tells us two things. Number one, she's validating her theory. And number two, she's describing that not only can you change your own mindset, but other people can change it for you by the way in which they frame things to you. Now, the way she explains it in her anecdote is that children have doubts quite often, which they ought to. They're children. They don't know about life yet or whether they'll be successful or unsuccessful or rich or poor or a star or, or not. And when you come along and tell them, well, you're smart, you deserve that, a whole bunch of kids are there like, no, I'm not. No, they don't want to say that to mommy or daddy, but they think mommy is just saying nice things to me. And then they get a kind of imposter syndrome where they become afraid of being revealed as not being smart. So they actually do things like say, I, 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 I don't really want to study math. I want to sing or something or go play or anything that doesn't involve doing a bunch of studying and then not getting an A and proving that they're not as smart as mommy or daddy said they were and disappointing themselves and everyone else and being embarrassed. This is the way she describes it. And that eh, kind of rings true with me. I kind of know that feeling when people, you know, put certain expectations on you. Now, We kind of have this model that if you tell someone you're talented, you're smart, you can do this. We heard this in Brian's talk earlier, those who are here, that they'll be there like, oh yeah, I can get it. But the opposite takes place. Brian spoke to that exact thing um, in his talk that you, know, you say, oh yeah, using maps and reduce is so, much, so easy. You'll, you already know a for loop, you're gonna find this uh, super easy. That just actually turns a bunch of people off while they're trying to learn it. You've done exactly the same thing. You've put a fixed mindset on it. You're talented, you can figure it out, and they can only go down from there when you told them that it was easy and they'd get it, right? They can't actually do better. And um, the opposite of that, the growth mindset, is to say, well, you may get it immediately, you may not, but for, I know for a fact that if you work on it, you'll get it, because people who work on it do get it. It is workable. I can't say whether you'll get it in 30 seconds or not, but I can say that if you try, you will get it. But you, but you have to try. And when you take this approach, as opposed to the approach of telling people that are talented, instead of them being in fear of the big accident, of the big reveal that they're not as good, they're not in control, they're not as smart, a different thing happens. They adopt a growth mindset of their own. Over time, with repetition, they get the idea that everything can be learned and practiced. Some things faster than others, but sooner or later, they learn everything. And when you say to children, and that includes children at the age of 55 or 65, that they can do it, they can grow, and they believe that, then they're more likely to try to learn and to grow. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you believe that attending a conference will help your career, funny thing happens. You go to conferences like everyone in this room. 
There are a bunch of people who are not here who believe it. Honestly, I mean, I, I, cannot, I cannot lie to you about this. It breaks my heart to think there are people who are not at this conference because they believe they're not smart and it wouldn't help them. That's heartbreaking to me. That's a tremendous waste of human potential and happiness. But that happens. So we can't go back in time and change the way their parents spoke to them or the way our parents spoke to us. But you know, there's a saying, the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago, the second best time is today. So that's why I'm here, let's plant some trees. So when the child gets this growth mindset feedback, oh, you got an A because you paid attention in class and because, uh, and because you studied, and when you study, you'll get good results. They think to themselves, ah, I'm a seedling, I can grow into a tree. And they try some more. And over time, she gives some exercises in her book for how we can work on our own mindsets. And she talks about how we can give feedback to colleagues or to our children. Over time, people can move from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. But it just takes Remember what I said about the cognitive behavioral therapy for learned optimism? It's the same thing. It's about repetition. It's not about me. I tell you something, you go, aha, and your life has changed. Or you read a book, and aha, as your life has changed. What changes your life is the actual work every day, every step on the way. That's what changes it. It's that consistency. It's doing it over and over and over again. But it works. And that's how you can change from this fixed mindset to the growth mindset. And this is Dr. Carol Dweck's theory. Now, the, the two things sound very similar in some ways, but there's a bit of a place where they sound like they don't fit. And that is this. People say, well, Dr. Seligman talks about taking permanent, general, personal sort of um, credit for your success. But Dr. Dweck says that if you believe you have this permanent, general, personal talent, it's a fixed mindset, and that actually makes you more unsuccessful. How do these two, two things fit together? Are they in conflict? Should it be a monkey knife fight between these two, these two psychologists? What's going on? So from here on in, I want to give you my opinion. I promised that I would be honest with you about which things are backed by research and which are not. This is just what I think. When we tell a child, when they get an A from studying, we're telling them that it is a personal thing they can do, they, they studied, but that it's temporary and it's specific. You got an A because you studied. But what about this? You got an A because when you study, your grades improve. Does that not make it permanent. It implies to them that a whole lifetime of study is ahead of them and a whole lifetime of, of good grades are ahead of them. But it's still specific. What about this? When you study, you learn and your grades reflect your learning. Does that not make it general? It's about learning that can apply to many things and the, the grade is just one example. This is personal, general and permanent positive feedback so it fits the learned optimism model, and it's the growth mindset as well. So there are some explanations that fit both models. They are not necessarily in conflict with each other. And my proposition, my conjecture, what I expect I'm going to be spending the next, uh, let's be optimistic here, shall we say 40 years of my life, testing this theory. I believe that you can embrace the growth mindset and the learned optimism mindset by the careful choice of the way in which you describe or attribute positive things in your life so that it fits both models. And here is a little summary of what we have to do with, with positive feedback. Emphasize the personal choice. It didn't just happen, you studied. Generalize the results. That created learning, which happened to result in an A on this test. And emphasize the ongoing arc. You will continue to learn and grow if you continue to study. 
Now, here's one that might be given to a colleague. Now, not all feedback is positive. Sometimes bad things happen to good people. I believe there's a book of that title. We have to be able to explain negative things in our life too. And we can do that while fitting both models. But now, we, we want to emphasize an impersonal cause of the event. We want to talk about a specific impact of it. And we want to say, hey, yeah, you know what? Even great actors make bad movies. This one thing happened. It's not forever. That, that is something we can do for ourselves. We can practice it. We can learn about cognitive behavioral therapy. You can go and see a psychologist to give you help with it, or you can just read a book about it. But of course, when it comes to giving feedback to other people, sometimes it's a little bit more complicated than just saying, well, this is how I'd explain it to myself. So you also want to avoid, when you give somebody feedback, say, in a work situation, if you give them general feedback about something, they, it's hard for them to actually do anything with it. It's, it's, it may be true, it may be optimistic, it may make them happier, but it's not constructive. Constructive feedback involves giving people to-dos in a nice way. So, one model for giving good feedback that also fits these, when you have some, something negative to say, you start with a statement, a true statement, an honest statement, we're not fluffing or lying to people, spinning things, that is very specific about what's wrong. This blog post lacks a narrative that would hold its arguments together. I have received that feedback on a, a number of times. Then what? Then we have to go to the constructive part. We frame the suggested course of action in optimistic terms. Hey, you know what? When you state and stick to a theme, your posts are always coherent. Now this person has given me some feedback, something I can work with, that is, notice, personal, general, and permanent. So now we're combining three different things. The learned optimism model, we're combining the growth mindset model, and we're, we're with a very common way to give constructive feedback whether it be in the home, at school, or with teammates. And this is a very important thing, because modern software development is not a lot about finding clever ways to combine map with, with reduce, with uh, react, with rx, with observables, and so on. Modern software development is about coordinating multiple people to do great work together. Modern software development is about being able to have a sustained pace of producing good work which means being motivated, motivating your teammates, having good feedback for your teammates, we're getting to the point where a pull request is more important than the code that's in the pull request, the conversation. Now, if you go back to, remember I mentioned earlier the people who say, I can outwork those, those people? We see that even their feeling about this, as much as it sounds like it doesn't, it doesn't fit with learned optimism, really is, what are they talking about? They say. I know a person, she gave a talk at a, at a conference that I was at recently, and she said, I may not be the smartest person, but I have grit. What is that if not a personal, general, and permanent approach to life? Now, is it an attribute? It's something she does. She works every day. She trains for bicycle races. Or another person may say, I, I'm not really good at writing a book, but if I do a few pages every day, no matter what, I will get a book done. People who talk in these terms are talking in terms that fit the learned optimism and the mindset model. So, all this comes down to the fact that we need to take care of ourselves and we need to take care of the teams that we're on, whether that be a personal team like your family, or whether that be a team at work, or whether it be a community like this excellent um, community here in Poland of programmers. And just as you care deeply, that's why you're here, about the way in which you craft code, everyone here, I'm sure, cares deeply about the way in which they work with other people and the way in which they work with their own brains. I mean, it's the tool that we always have. Vim, Emacs, JavaScript, .NET, these things may come and go, but our brains are in our head, and that's it. That's all you get is your brain, and the way you take care of it matters, both to your career and to your happiness. 
And so that's why I'm here today. We've got lots of technical talks. I'm sorry I only had one slide of technology for you. But I really believe that in moderation, some investment in ourselves and the computing engine inside of our, our head and in the way our teams work is also necessary for us to go forward and to continue to change society. There's another generation of people coming after us who, will be, who are, we are bequeathing the code that we write, the companies that we create, the society that we change, and the better tools we have for doing that ourselves at every level, from editor to comp compiler to server to within our head to the way in which we organize our teams, will matter to what we leave behind as a legacy when we finally have to say goodbye. So, as I said, some of this is opinion, some of this is anecdote, and some of this is research. But if any of it rings true with you, please go and look for the book Learned Optimism or Carol Dweck's book Mindset and decide for yourself. You are worth it. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Anybody? Bueller? In that case, I would say everyone have a great conference and I'll see you all tomorrow. Oh, no, do we have someone? Yes. Ah, so um, there I will say, read more in the book. Um, Dr. Seligman, part of the challenge is I'm going to say right away, you know, being more productive as a programmer, I always want to yell bullshit when people talk about being more productive as programmers because I don't know that we have a reliable way of measuring pro programmer productivity. We sort of do it after the fact. Oh, this person did some work, they must be productive. But we have no predictive thing. Well, if you use Emacs, you're going to be 10% more productive than if you use Vim. So, you know, it's just my conjecture that some of Seligman's work would apply to programmers because I do not believe he actually tested programmers. He tested uh, people in sales. He tested uh, people in office environments doing, you know, knowledge work. Um, he tested, I believe, students who were studying and getting grades. Do those things extrapolate right to programming? Sometimes it's dangerous to say they absolutely do because sometimes what we do is so completely different that you can't extrapolate. Um, from my anecdotal experience, I would say that the fewer days I spend being depressed, the more productive I am. And that's all I can share with you. But I don't believe we have, I don't want to make a, cl a hard claim that we can prove that for programming. It's just a conjecture on my part. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Anybody else? That was a great question. Okay, thank you very, very, very much. I'll see you all tomorrow.